Cullenberg, an historical hill at the height of 483 metres. It's visible from all parts of Vienna and surrounds the capital of Austria from the north. The hill Cullenberg was originally known as Schweinsberg due to the large herds of boars that grazed there. Hunts were often organised in these forests during which the dogs through their barking created uneasiness among the inhabitants of Vienna. Therefore the place was popularly called Cullenberg, that is, the hill of barking dogs. The Emperor changed the name Schweinsberg to Josefsberg but the people still call the hill Cullenberg. This hill and upon it the post Kamaldolis Church of St. Joseph became an integral part of the events of Vienna as also of the history of the whole of Europe. Jesteśmy na miejscu wyjątkowym w dziejach nie tylko tego kraju ale Polski całej Europy pojem nawet świat na Kalembergu na Kalembergu, który był świadkiem wielu ciekawych wydarzeń był świadkiem i cudu początki Kalembergu to wiek jedenasty for four centuries, the owners of Cullenberg were canons regular from Klosterneuburg. In 1627, Emperor Ferdinand II, thanks to the help of the Polish magnate Michowaj Wolski, brought to Vienna from Italy the Kamaldolese and during the exchange talks with the canons regular, he obtained Cullenberg and passed it on to the Kamaldolese under the condition that a cloister and church would be built there. On the 10th of August 1629, in the presence of Emperor Ferdinand II, the Apostolic Nuncio John Pilotti blessed the cornerstone of the church and hermitage. During the Thirty Year War in 1643, the Swedes looted the working and livestock quarters of the hermitage forcing the hermits to leave the cloister for the duration of the war. On Kallenberg, the Kamaldolese would be present for altogether 153 years until the year 1782, when a ban on cloisters came into effect in Austria. In this time, they died here. They are 80 and are godly buried in the catacombs. Tymże kościele odegrali wielką rolę. Przede wszystkim modlili się za Europę, modlili się za świat. Ważnym punktem w dziejach tego miejsca to znana całemu światu tak zwana odsiecz wiedeńska. W roku 1683 Europa została środkowa zaatakowana przez islam. Groziła jej wielka niewola, długa niewola. The King of Poland, John Sobieski III, at his quarters in Wilanów near Warsaw in 1683, led talks with the Emperor Leopold I about an alliance between Poland and Austria in case of there being any aggression from Turkey. The alliance with the Habsburg Empire at that time was more advantageous to the intentions of the king and actual interests of the Polish Commonwealth than an alliance with France against Austria based solely on promises for the future. Austria, bound with Poland by common interests, had to boldly declare its opposition towards its eastern neighbour. Emperor Leopold threatened directly by the Ottoman power, was obtaining a strong ally in the Polish Commonwealth and through the influence of John III. He wanted to draw back the Hungarian insurgents under the leadership of Emmerich Tokoloy from taking an active part in the expedition against the Habsburgs in union with the Turkish army. Towards the end of the 17th century, during the reign of the Sultan Mohammed IV, 
Turkey was preparing a great expedition against Christian Europe. In the year 1682, the Sultan sent the Emperor Leopold I the following letter. We, Muhammad, the famous and almighty Emperor of Babylon and Judea, great king of the holy Arabia and Mauritania, famous king of Jerusalem, Lord and ruler of the tomb of the crucified God of the unfaithful, send our holy words to you, Emperor of Rome, and to you, Polish king, that we intend to invade your country with war. We will devastate it with fire and sword. We order you to wait for us in your residence in Vienna so that we may be able to cut off your head. And you, little king of Poland, wait there for us. We will destroy you along with all your insurgents and we will wipe you off the face of the earth along with every being that calls itself a gore. The Grand Vizier, Kara Mustafa Pasha, a fanatic herald of the conquering ideas of Islam, was the heart and soul of these preparations. More enlightened men of the Ottoman Empire and the educated Arabs saw in Kara Mustafa the origin of evil and the cause of bloodshed. Salamun alaikum. Wybacz przedostojny. Zacny efendi mufti Ibrahim pragnie widzieć twe czcigodne oblicze. To niech zacny efendi Ibrahim zobaczy je po rannych modłach. Odejdź. Nie widzisz, że jestem zajęty? Zacny efendi Ibrahim mówił, że jego słowa będą krótkie, ale ważne jak sury proroka. Efendi Ibrahim jest niebezpiecznie śmiały, tak mówiąc. Wszyscy znają jego odwagę i mądrość mój przeczcigodny. Wprowadź. Strzeż się słów kara Mustafy, sułtanie. Strzeż się swoich słów, Efendi, bo czyny wielkiego wezywa potrafią być okrutniejsze niż jego słowa. Jego serce jest mężne, lecz nienasycone, czcigodny. Jego serce jest jak miecz. Nie mieczem dżihad sławi chwałę Allaha, przeczcigodny, a duchem. Duchem! Zdobyliśmy Cypr, Albanię, Mołdawię i Kretę. Tak, to duch sprawia, że ziemi niewiernych są już prawie w naszych rękach. Po tym, jak przez 30 lat białuży wyżynali się, tocząc ze swych żył świńską krew. Tak, to duch sprawia, że Węgrzy oddają się pod skrzydła wielkiej porty, występując przeciwko Habsburgowi. Ha! Tak, to duch sprawia, że papież trzęsie sutanną przed wielką chorąbią proroka i zwołuje na trwogę Ligę Niewiernych. Niezbadana jest moc wiary, czcigodny. Zdobędziemy świat słowem proroka, a nie mieczem. Potrzeba nam przemocnej wiary. No to padaj na twarz, Efendi, i się módl. Założę się z tobą o tysiąc złotych podkup, że jutro sam Mahomet wstąpi z nieba i na srebrnej tacy poda mi głowę papieża. Bez udziału naszego wieża. Nie głowa papieża będzie naszym zwycięstwem, a prosta droga naszej woli. Kto cię nauczył tych mądrości? Kto? Święte pismo Koranu, czcigodny. Bóg sprowadza z drogi, kogo chce i prowadzi drogą prostą, kogo chce. Jeśli utopimy Europę we krwi, Allah się od nas odwróci. Luźnisz! Powiem ci to, gdy te herezje do twojej głowy. Znam ja twoich mentorów, Efendi. Zacni ludzie donieśli mi o twoich konszachtach z żydowskimi rabinami, o twoich dyskusjach z papieskim plenipotentem Dawiano. Nie jest to grzech ni zdrada rozmawiać z mędrcami o Bogu. O jakim Bogu ty mówisz? Bóg Żydów i Białorów nie jest naszym Bogiem. Jest jeden Allah, przeczcigodny sułtanie. Wszyscyśmy Jego dziećmi. Miłość, nie miecz i chciwość jest Panem naszej woli. Taka jest prawda. Pismo mówi, obowiązkiem jest przestrzeganie praw szariatu, aby bezprawnie nie powodować rozlewu krwi. I ja ci pismem odpowiem. Cała ziemia jest własnością Allaha. Z jego polecenia rządzi nią namiestnik. 
to ja, sułtan. Taka jest prawda. Może w nią nie wierzysz, Efendi? Allah jedynym mi sułtanem. Odejdź, zacny Efendi. Będę myślał w nocy o twoich słowach. Salem alejko. Stało się według Twojego rozkazu, przedostojny. Stało się według woli Allaha. I nie ma na tym świecie nikogo, kto by jego gniew powstrzymał. Nie ma nikogo, kto by mój miecz zatrzymał. Nikogo. The first to understand the full danger that approached from the east was Pope Blessed Innocent XI. It was he who found the right reasons to persuade rulers to overcome their nationalistic egos and unwillingness to stand together against the foe. The Pope was aware that not only was this a defense of Vienna before another military attack of an expansive nation, but a defense of Europe against a flood of the Ottoman Empire, the representative of aggressive Islam. Because Austria was threatened with the first attack from Turkey, the Pope issued her with every needed subsidy so that she would possess every means to repulse the enemy. In the midst of the Pope's and Emperor's provided subsidies was also Poland, who was known for its past defences of Europe before the Turkish invaders. On this basis, the Pope headed towards a signed Polish-Austrian alliance and a creation of an anti-Turk Holy League for the defence of Christianity. The signing of the alliance came to be on the 1st of April 1683. It was an offensive-defensive alliance whose guarantor was the Pope Innocent XI. On the 14th of July 1683, the great vizier Kara Mustafa with his 107,000 manned army plus 30,000 Wallachian, Hungarian and Tatar Watahas stood near Vienna. In a letter addressed to the Emperor Leopold I, he threatened that whoever does not surrender and does not accept Islamic faith will suffer death and the country will fall into complete ruin. Soon, the Turks captured the outer suburbs of the capital and cut Vienna off from the left shore of the Danube. The spirit of an approaching defeat hovered above Vienna. Pope Innocent XI turned to the King of Poland with the request, Rescue Christianity. Emperor Leopold I wrote on the 3rd of August, We beg your majesty that you may wish to, as quickly as possible, continue on the path you have set afoot. The commander of the Austrian army, Charles V, Duke of Lorraine, wrote to the King, Poland, from the Emperor's camp. I eagerly ask your majesty to hasten one's coming and with his well-suited army to stand with us in person so that under your leadership the weary Vienna may obtain help and the Christian world may be rescued. The Polish forces 
now understood that the liberation mission making its way to Vienna was not of a mercenary form, but of faithful knights that enkindled zeal for the defence of the Christian world. On the way, the knights stopped in Chonstochowa, where on Jasna Gura they offered their prayers for victory before the miraculous image of the Mother of God. There, Sobieski went to confession and received Holy Communion. From the monks, he received a copy of the Jasna Gura Madonna, which he took to Vienna. He was also presented with the sabre of Hetman Stanislav Solkiewski of Hochim as a herald of the imminent victory. Sobieski led an army of about 21,000 men, which included 25 Hussar banners. On the 26th of July, he left Krakow with haste for the Vienna siege, not waiting for the late-coming Lithuanians. The path of the march that he led was through Silesia, Moravia and Czech lands. On the 3rd of September, Allied armies, numbering about 67,000, found themselves near Vienna. Prince Charles V, Duke of Lorraine, led the Austrian armies. Ernest Rudiger von Starenberg directed the defence of the besieged Vienna. Elector Johann George III commanded the Saxon army. Friedrich von Waldeck was the leader of the Franconian armies. Maximilian Emmanuel II led the Bavarian army. Prince Eugene of Savoy, with this battle for Kullenberg, began his army career. His brigade of dragoons was subordinate to the Allied armies. King Sobieski largely counted on the valiant Hussar cavalry, who had many times in the past proven itself in many different wars in the defence of Poland and Europe's independence. Duke Charles V of Lorraine, leader of the Austrian armies, at first did not share with the Polish king that opinion. No, jak tam twoja piechota się nasił? Strach? Widzą króla między sobą, to i portkami nie trzęsą, wasza wysokość. No to idziemy sprawdzić. A te skrzydła? Chyba żeby przefrunąć przez wzgórze Hallenbergu. Nie wierzysz, książę, w siłę mej husarii. Wybacz, wasza królewska mość, ale to nie był trafny wybór brać tę pancerną jazdę. Góry! No i w te olbrzymy łatwo trafić z muszkietu, jak słonia. Wystaw, książę, swój najlepszy czworobok i walczmy. Nie na pchły. Na kule i żelazo. Atencio! At ordinem! Szablę w dłoń! Prezentuj broń! Salut! Vivat Rex Polonie! Vivat Rex Polonie! Vivat! A council of the commanders of the Allied armies convened on the 3rd of September in Stettelsdorf, not far from Tullen, near Vienna at Prince Hardig's castle. The strategy of the whole battle had to be discussed but more importantly, the commanding post had to be entrusted to a leader who was experienced in the art of war. Emperor Leopold I retreated to the borderline between Austria and Bavaria to Passau. The whole Austrian army he left to the leadership of Duke Charles V. Who will take chief command of the Allied armies? Poland was represented by John Sobieski III, and two imperial hetmans, Stanisław Jabłonowski and Mikołaj Sienjawski. On the side of the emperor, Duke Charles of Lorraine, 
and Margrave Hermann von Baden. From the German side, Prince Friedrich von Waldeck, John George III, Elector of Saxony, and his General Joachim Goltz, Father Marco de Aviano, and Jacob, King John III's son. Niech się wypowie książę Saski. On ma świeże oko. Ryzykowny manewr. Rzucić wszystko bitwą na jedną szalę? Cóż książę radzisz? Proponuję szerokie obejście Wiednia. Racja. Manewr zmusi wroga do odstąpienia od miasta. I mniejsze straty po naszej stronie. <śmiech> Bzdury. Wasza wysokość jesteś w mniejszości. Chcesz tu absolutyzm à la France uprawiać? Bardziej oświecony. Spójrzcie na mapę. Turcy zamkną nas pod trzasku od strony Dunaju i wyżną jak kury. Trzeba odejść jak najdalej od rzeki i uderzyć od strony lasu wiedeńskiego. Jak wasza wysokość tę swoją ciężką jazdę przerzuci? Toż górski teren. Pacjar, pacjar. Mój żołnierz przecierpi, ale zwycięży. Wasza królewska mość nie uchodzi lekceważyć naszych głosów. Nie jesteście dowódcą. Oto laska marszałkowska, ofiarowana mi przez cesarza. Laska marszałkowska to jeszcze nie była na naczelnego wodza. Nie lekceważę waszych głosów. Mój plan to rozbić armię turecką na kaput mortu, aby głowa potwora nie odrosła i nie ukąsiła chrześcijańskiej Europy nigdy więcej. Wasz plan ma rację Słazoria, ale nie zniszczy osmańskiego imperium ad fine. Zgoda. Wybierzmy spośród nas wodza. Zgódźmy się, że to wasza królewska mość po honorze i pierwszeństwie korony będzie naszą zjednoczoną armią dowodzić. Słucham! Jakiś jeszcze fortel na wroga szukujesz. Przeprawić się przez Dunaj aż pod Tur, gdzie Turcy najmniej się nas spodziewają. Opóźnić marsz. Uderzyć z nastaniem deszczy jesiennych. Co? Wasza królewska mość liczy jeszcze na litewski odwód? Hmm. Przekreśliłem zdrajców dawno w moich planach. Liczę na wilgoć, która pro w muszkietach i armatach tureckich adnichy uczyni. W jeden się nie utrzyma. Wasza królewska mość. Masz za nic mieszkańców Wiednia i ich życie? Koncept godny mahometańskiego sułtana który ludzi jak bydło traktuje, a nie chrześcijańskiego króla. Chrystus i Matka Przenajświętsza mi świadkami, że komunita Syrium to ludzie, a nie mury Wiednia. Ale nie mamy raportów. Nie wiemy jaka Sytuacja w mieście. Ostatnia kwestia. Dlaczego mamy uderzyć od zachodu? Dowiesz się książę podczas bitwy. Proponuję, aby wodzem naszych sprzymierzonych armii był... Zgłaszam. Jan III Sobieski. Weto zgłaszam. Książę Karl Lotaryński. Jego to ziemia. Niech on ją wyzwoli. Mea Vox. Zgadzam się na księcia Karola.
wolą Ojca Świętego jest, gdy chrześcijańską armią dowodził Rex Polonie, Joannes Sobieski. The papal delegate, Capuchin Father Marco de Aviano, as the representative of the Holy Father Innocent XI, was highly favoured and trusted. He was the spiritual and political advisor of the Pope and Emperor in all sorts of difficult cases, but most of all he was a person that day and night was dedicated to prayer. He prayed eagerly like Innocent XI, for a peaceful end to the invasion without the spilling of blood. Ecce crux domini. Uciekajcie wszyscy wrogowie. However, when all hope failed and the deciding moment of the battle had arrived, Father Marco de Aviano continuously prepared the knights for battle for the defense of the faith and he fervently prayed. Przybą, do pomóż nam. Wielki Boże zastępu. Ty wiesz, że my kochamy tylko pokój. Pokój z Tobą, między nami, z naszym bliźnim. Jeżeli moja śmierć może się przysłużyć, oddaję Ci, Boże, moje życie, jako żertwę. Nie wzbraniam się umierać. Wyciągam ręce jak Mojżesz, aby wszyscy poznali, że Ty jesteś jedynym potężnym Bogiem. Na chwałę Twojego imienia daj nam zwycięstwo! After the meeting of the armies at Tullen, King Sobieski decided on the hard march for Cullenberg through the hills, the so-called Vienna Forest. The night of the 9th to 10th of September, the guides stood in the forest in Konigstetten, near a bricked palace. It had been ransacked and abandoned by the Turks, but not completely. Soldiers searched out all the cellars where they found about 200 barrels of wine. An eyewitness, Mikowaj Djakowski, lieutenant of the Royal Army, wrote in his journal, The plebs began to drink terribly. When the king heard of this, he sent the royal hetman, Jabłonowski, to stop them. The hetman then, being a prudent leader, ordered the barrels of wine to be hacked to pieces. Then heavy rain came down and a modest tent was erected for the king. The Duke of Lorraine, Charles V, set up his tent on Cullenberg among the walls of a church burnt down by the Turks. On the 10th of September, from Cullenberg, he fired a rocket signalling to the besieged Viennese people that the arrival of the awaited liberation was approaching. King Sobieski arrived at Cullenberg on Saturday the 10th of September with his whole headquarters and called a meeting with all the leaders of the Allied armies. On Sunday the 12th of September at 3 in the morning, the king ordered for a battlefield altar to be set up in the rear sacristy. <laughs> I dlatego bitwę następnego dnia, 12 września, rozpoczął mszą świętą, wierząc, że tylko Bóg może nas uchronić od największego nieszczęścia. Otwary rano, tutaj msza święta, do której służył Jan III Sobieski ze swoim synem, 16-letnim Jakubem, z innymi dowódcami. Potem ostatnia narada wojenna, a udające się na pole bitwy rycerstwo nasze sowieckie błogosławił w Boga i Maryi wybroniło chrześcijańskie Europy. On this memorable day stood an army of about 67,000 allied forces battle ready, of which 21,000 were Poles. Kara Mustafa led into battle about 107,000 of his own troops, of which about 30,000 were engaged with the storming of the walls of Vienna. Apart from an advantage in numbers, 
What helped the Turks was their good position in the wine hills and fields, which greatly impeded the march of the Allied armies, especially the heavy cavalry. King Sobieski personally directed the whole engagement, often standing in the dangerous line of fire. Commanding the Polish army, he counted greatly on the Hussars and Marcin Katski's cuirassier attacks, storming the enemy's camps. Among the Polish commanders was Field Hetman Mikołaj Sienjaski and Royal Hetman Stanisław Jabłonowski. They made up the right wing of the Allied army. The Turks tried attacking the Polish right wing, but they were quite quickly repelled. The Hussar cavalry sowed fear and horror not only among the Turkish army, but also caused great panic amongst their horses and camels. It was the sound of the wind rushing through the feathers of the soldiers that created this panic. Sobieski called to battle the cuirassiers and the hussars, and having reached the Turkish camp, he attacked it. First the Tatars' cavalry, and then the camp's crew and Yanissary infantry took to panic and retreating flight, wading across the waters of the Vienna River. The Grand Vizier Kara Mustafa ran away sheepishly from the field of battle, sensing the imminent defeat. Light cavalry took chase after the retreating enemy. The conquered Turkish banner was hastily presented to the commander King Sobieski by the Hussars. The Polish monarch, certain of the banner being of the Sultan of the Great Prophet, sent it straight after the battle to Pope Innocent XI, along with a letter which began with the words Venimus, Vidimus, Deus, Visit. We came, we saw, God conquered. On Sunday, evening of the 12th of September, the Battle of Vienna had ended. The victory was enormous. Later that night, when the noise of the camp had died down, John III sat down to continue his normal correspondence with his wife. God and our Lord, for all ages blessed, to our nation gave victory and glory of the kind that past ages has never heard of. The dukes rushed towards me, as did the Bavarian elector, Waldeck, throwing their arms around my neck and kissing me on the cheek, while the generals kissed the hands and feet, not to mention the knights, officers and all the cavalry and infantry regiments who continuously shouted, Ah, unser brave König, Jan Następnego dnia Sobieski wjeżdżał już do wolnego miasta w Wiedniu. Entuzjazm przeogromny, radość. A król świadom, kto tu dokonał tego cudu zwycięstwa, bo inaczej tego zwycięstwa nie można nazwać jak cudem. Bo jako historyk nie znam takiej bitwy w dziejach świata, która by w kontekście tak wielkiego zagrożenia, jak wtedy zakończyła się w jednym dniu tak wspaniałym zwycięstwem. Dziękował Bogu w centrum miasta w kościele Augustianów, w tym razem dzień czynną mszą świętą, na zakończenie której zaintonował Tedeum Daudamus, Ciebie Boga wysławiamy. The entry of the victorious Allied army into Vienna became Sobieski's real triumph. The people of the liberated capital enthusiastically welcomed its redeemer, throwing themselves to his hands and feet in an act of thanksgiving. On the 14th of September, two days after the battle, Emperor Leopold I arrived from Passau and met with John III in the field near the suburb Schwerhut. The following day, during an official meeting, the Emperor made a speech. This is how an eyewitness, Johann Peter van Wackeren, recalls it. In his words, he conveyed his immense gratitude to the King, who faced with many difficulties the prospect of having to take on such a long march, deigned to help to conquer a common enemy of Christianity. To his merits, after the only one God, Vienna owes its successful liberation.
Pope Innocent XI, in gratitude to Poland for their defense of Christianity, included the Polish eagle in his family's coat of arms, Odyskalci, along with the decree that the white eagle was to be placed along with his family's coat of arms on his sarcophagus. The Pope also sent John III gifts blessed by him, a sword and a hat. Blessed Innocent the Eleventh wished to commemorate in the history of the Church the importance of this battle that saved Christianity and for that purpose he instituted the Feast of the Name of Mary for the day 12th of September. The Holy See also decided that in memory of the siege of Vienna in the centre of Rome a church honouring the name of Mary would be erected. Wtedy właśnie ten kościół, ten klasztor, cztery dni przed bitwą, co ilustruje ta makieta, został zniszczony. Tak. Kamedulni z wielkim trudem odnowili tę świątynię, a potem spotkało ich większe nieszczęście. Cesarz Józef II, likwidując klasztory, usunął kamedułów wraz na zawsze z kalebelu. I od tego to właśnie czasu Kościół Kalemberski popadł w straszliwą ruinę. Aż strach pomyśleć, czy za czasów napoleońskich była magazynem. Nie zadbała Austria o cmentarz poległych naszych rycerzy, który rozciąga się stąd prawie aż po centrum miasta. Tak. Nie ma już ani jednego krzyża na grobach. Domy stoją, drzewa rosną. A w głębi ziemi nasi rycerze, którzy oddali życie za ten kraj. The Church of St. Joseph was built on Cullenberg in 1639 by the Camaldolese Fathers. The sponsor of this work was Empress Eleonora, Archduke Leopold, and other distinguished men. Its characteristic simpleness is typical of the Camaldolese style. It is a one-winged building with one tower. On the southern side, adjacent to the church, is what used to be a library and an elevated residence for priests. The interior furnishings of the church date back to the late Baroque. The backdrop to the cross is a large painting done by Frederick Schilcher in 1852 by the request of Mr. and Mrs. Finsterl. It depicts angels with the instruments of the Lord's Passion. Below the cross is a faithful copy of the painting from the Church of the Name of Mary in Rome, which was sent to Cullenberg by Pope Pius X. A copy of Our Lady of Częstochowa was offered in 1906 by the General of the Pauline Fathers, Father Eusebius Reimann. The Madonna known as Sobieskis is a painting that was presented to King Sobieski by Pope Clement XI for the victory at Vienna. The present organ was built in 1910 and its casing originates from the 18th century. The Sobieski Chapel. Leading up to the chapel are forged bars with the initials of John Sobieski. The plaque informs us that in this place, before the battle, Father Marco de Aviano celebrated Holy Mass. It was celebrated before the image of Our Lady of Częstochowa. The bars open with the initials of the King, J.S. 
In the altar, a painting of Pope Innocent XI praying for victory. Above the mark on the banner of the Emperor Constantine the Great, it is written in hoc signo in this sign. The papal legate, Father Marco de Aviano, celebrating Holy Mass before the battle. A symbolic picture of a Polish knight placing the Turkish banner at the feet of Saint Joseph, the patron of Kullenberg. Monument of King Sobieski. On the wall and ceiling, 102 coat of arms of Polish knights, predominantly of the high-ranking officers of the Polish Hussars and Allied forces. A copy of John Matejko's painting Sobieski at Vienna, the work of the painter Stokwaszynski. Matejko's original was offered to Pope Leo XIII and is found in the Vatican. A saber offered to Sobieski after the Vienna victory. In the sacristy is found a treasury with mementos of the Camaldolese fathers as also ones associated with the siege of Vienna. In a valuable antique wardrobe from the 18th century is found a statue of Saint Romold, the founder of the Camaldolese. The upper wall painting depicts episodes from the life of Saint Romold the statue of Our Lady with the child Jesus, conquering plague and death, placed there in 1679 as a sign of gratitude for saving the life of the monks during the great epidemic. Old historical books depicting the events of the siege of Vienna. A treasury contains white weapons, coins, medals and different Turkish relics. Coins knives, a Turkish dagger, swords, swords and medals, a Turkish sheet of metal with intricate drawings, wooden beads, a picture of trophies, medal of the siege, medals of the third centenary anniversary in 1983. The plaque of the Resurrectionists as a tribute to the Polish King. The church and Sobieski chapel were restored by the Congregation of the Resurrection. In the 19th century, in the restoration of antiques, great merits had been bestowed by the family of John and Josephine Finisterl. John and Josephine Finisterl, with their own money, saved it from complete ruin in the year of our Lord, 1852. Gustav and Anna Benishko, their heirs, took care of it for 30 years, until the time when they kindly passed it on to the Congregation of the Resurrection in 1906, who beautifully restored and decorated it. A commemorative plaque in honour of the Baron Professor Gubrinovich, who dedicated a lot of his time, strength and money for the restoration and upkeep of this holy place. The museum project was prepared by an excellent Polish painter, Professor Józef Mehofer. The outbreak of World War I thwarted all the plans. In the year of 1930, the repainting of the chapel was entrusted to the painter John Rosen, professor of the Lvov Institute of Technology. In 1975, the Krakow painter Panaszek renewed the paintings and painted the portraits of the heroes of Vienna. Największym wydarzeniem po zwycięstwie odniesionym tutaj w 1683 roku po Wiktorii Wiedeńskiej była obecność dziś Sługi Bożego Ojca Świętego Jana Pawła II. To on właśnie tutaj, w tej kaplicy przed tym papieżem, modlił się. Po długiej modlitwie powiedział mi tak, mój drogi, prosiłem tu Boga o głęboką wiarę i nadzieję dla narodu polskiego. 
as a sign of his great reverence for this place made holy by the blood of the heroes defending Christianity, Pope John Paul II, similarly as Pope Leo XIII, offered to the museum of this sanctuary his shoes and his zachetto cap. It is a symbol of the offering of one's whole self from head to toe for the sake of commemorating the memory of those who died. Father Peter Kaglik, the rector of the sanctuary, explains to the Pope exponents in the church museum the blessing of the Sobieski plaque, the dedication of the Our Lady of Częstochowa chapel, the blessing of the liturgical vestments. We desire to express our greatest gratitude to Almighty God for the courage and strength given to our fathers. We desire here in Vienna to render homage to King John Sobieski for his defense of the threatened homeland and for this reason, that when Europe, the Church, and Christian culture were also threatened, he stood to defend them. We commemorate the armies under the King's command, among them especially our countrymen, the Knights who served in Vienna. We commemorate and pay homage to their sacrifice and fortitude. May eternal light shine upon them and may the same light illuminate our ways the ways of the contemporary generations of our brothers and sisters in the homeland and in the entire world.